Hello, and welcome to the National Book Foundation's Book Up at Home monthly author visit series. My name is Andy Donnelly, and I am the Education Programs Manager at the National Book Foundation. Part of our mission at the National Book Foundation is to connect people with books. Often that means connecting young people with authors and teaching artists in a book club setting. But this year, it also means offering these virtual spaces for young people to connect with authors and ask questions about writing and reading. Thank you to our BookUp partners for connecting students with these virtual events. And thank you to our funders at the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Thank you all for being here. And thank you in particular to Rita Williams Garcia, who joins us as a featured author for this month. Rita is a longtime member of the National Book Awards family. She has been a finalist three times for the National Book Award. She has also received the Coretta Scott King Author Award, the NAACP Image Award for Literature for Young People, and the Newbery Honor. She is the author of many books, including Gone Crazy in Alabama, Bottle Cap Boys, One Crazy Summer, and Clayton Bird Goes Underground. Students who are participating in the Book Up After School program have received a copy of Clayton Bird Goes Underground, and they have questions for Ms. Williams Garcia about this book and her work. Our conversation today will be about that book, as well as her writing life and her reading life. We will begin with a presentation from Ms. Williams Garcia and follow up with a Q&A. If you have a question for the author, please type that question in the Q&A box. You can submit questions at any point during the event. And with that, I'll turn things over to Rita Williams Garcia. Well, hello, hello, and thank you for inviting me and for also joining me in this discussion about Clayton Bird Goes Underground. Um, I, I can't help it. Any opportunity to talk about my work, um, I am there. Next. So um, I want to tell you just a little bit about my family and myself. Um, next. Yes, um, and um, and just how I come to write. I, I come from a typical um, New York family. We start out struggling. We start out poor, but you know we're determined, and we move from the uh, projects in Far Rockaway uh, to Arizona, and then to Seaside, California, which is where I had most of my childhood. Um, next. I was very lucky to have Miss Essie for a mother because my mother was a mother like no other. She played music all the time and well on the on the uh, record player. Uh, yes, record player. Google that. And um and all kinds of music, everything from folk to um uh rock and roll, the early rock and roll blues, jazz, and psychedelic jazz, um, or psychedelic rock. Um, yeah, my mother even ran away from home to see Jimi Hendrix and just left us behind. Uh, we saw her the next day. Next. Um, but my mother couldn't sing and neither could I. So we had to go to my father's side of the family for the for those talented voices and and uh, musicians, um, and uh, the Williamses played everything and sang everything from rhythm and blues to gospel. You might even see some of my family members on BET um, Sunday Best and uh, and those uh, programs on Sunday mornings. And then um, uh, one of my relatives might look familiar to you. I'm also related to the brilliant rapper, uh, the late Tupac Shakur. Next. But the character who Clayton is, um, uh, who Clayton is named for, uh, is my uncle Clayton Williams, who is in the center, um, and he sang all the time. He he was sometimes our babysitter when we were young, so we always heard his velvet tones. Next, um, that is me at thirteen. Um, I was pretty serious about writing next. And so um, I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to not just tell stories. I wanted to be an author. So I checked out books about writing and uh, I learned how to prepare a manuscript. But most important, I wrote 
every day. I wrote 500 words every day, mainly because I knew that uh, uh, publishers paid by the word for like magazines and so forth. So I wanted to make a lot of money. So uh, I used, I would read some of this now. I still have these notebooks. This is, this is my memoir of elementary school. This is my first novel. Anyway, I read some of it. Oh my goodness. Thank goodness no one else read it but it was still valuable. It taught me a lot, especially to not fear the blank page. Blank page, what is that? I'm here to write. Next. I did finally uh, sell my first novel, I I'm sorry, um, short story, about uh, like a year later um, to Highlights Magazine. And I, uh, my family, everybody, we were all so happy, but, um, we also needed the money. It wasn't a lot, but it did come in handy. Next. So I am most known for um, the uh, Gaither Sisters trilogy. These are stories that take place in the, 19, the late 1960s and the early 70s about three sisters who um, are at the turning point of identity, culture, struggle. Um, so they, in the first book, they uh, land in, um, they land in the center of the Black Panther movement. In the second book, um, they are experiencing a lot of change, um, even the struggle for women to, um, to hold power. Um, and in the third book, uh, the girls um, go home to their, uh, to their Alabama roots. Now, um, I had a lot of success with, the, with those books, but it was time for me to do something new, to find a new voice. Next. And so um, I was, so one of the things that I do for inspiration is I listen to music, um, I look at art, um, I look at videos, anything, anything different to kind of spark me. And I was watching some YouTube videos and I saw rapper um, Doug E. Fresh, who was, um, uh, he he's like the human beatbox. And he was uh, performing Biz Markie's iconic, You Got What I Need. And he was uh, doing both beatbox, beatboxing and playing the harmonica. And I was like, hmm. That's interesting. Two very different kinds of music, musical genres. What if I put them together, say like the blues and old school hip hop? And so I began to think about that more and more. Next. And so um, I thought about the elements of old school hip hop that I would incorporate in my story, which would be like boom boxes. I mean, there was a time that you could not walk down Jamaica Avenue or Hollis or, you know, um, anywhere in Queens without somebody blast it, carrying and blasting their boom box. And then you had to have a piece of cardboard to, to like dance, you know, to um, to do your break dancing. Uh, you know, people would get on subways with all this like really big uh, cardboard and stuff. Um, so, so it was that and next. And also the uh, next, and also the uh, like the um, the role of the DJ. The DJ controlled the party, not just playing music, but also doing chants. And so it was always like, um, you know, yelling things like, wave your hands in the air. Okay, you always supposed to say like you just don't care. Okay, stuff like that. Okay, so I wanted to put a lot of those different elements in the story <laughs> next. But, you know, it's good to have like ideas and concepts, but you need a character. And so I began to think about Clayton um, and what he would be like and um, what he would want and what would get in his way. And so it helps me a lot to have pictures around. So I, I go to Google uh, and, and I just start um, snatching pictures and, and thinking about who Clayton is. Next. I also needed a firm image of Cool Papa Bird, which is his beloved grandfather. Um, and so I went to 
uh, I went to Google once again to look at um, to look at um, like blues musicians. And so next, I settled on BB um, King, uh, the legend of blues, who is no longer with us. And uh, and because of his past, because he passed while I was writing this story, I felt that loss even more. So um, so I thought he was perfect. Next. Then I start writing. Um, this is what it actually looks like. Um, I, I write in columns. I hand write first. Uh, I, I don't know. I like to feel the rhythm of writing on the page. Next. And then um, I start to listen to, uh, since I'm going to write a lot about the blues, I started to listen to um, a lot of blues music and not just the music itself, but the patterns. So I learned how to write blues patterns by um, um, just listening and kind of figuring out the rhyme of the call and response. Next. Uh, had to learn how to play a harmonica or blues harp, um, uh, just so that I could capture what Clayton felt like on the inside. So I had to learn how to draw a breath in and blow it out and also how to bend a note. Next. I took my camera down to uh, the village um, and started, you know, sn uh, snapping pictures next of um, all kinds of images next of images um, in the village because I knew that Clayton would be on a journey and um, and that he would um, um, also be on the train. And um, and so next. Um, uh, okay, I did not go down into the tunnel, but, so I had to get this one off of Google, but I also had to see what would he see if he got on in the um, in the tunnels next. Um, and then also, um, because there would be some dancing going on, I had to really feel like where everything was from the poles, the seats, how close people would be. It was really good to have these pictures next. Um, and then, of course, I had to pick out his harmonica, and it had to have a little bit of metal on it, so I had that firm picture. So not only did I have to have his harmonica next, I also had to have three distinct guitars for, um, for Cool Papa next. Um, this is something that I do uh, when I get a little stuck or I just can't really contain myself. I, I do something else. In this case, I made a collage of images that uh, represent different aspects of the book. Uh, that just really helps me to kind of start seeing where I'm going and to get a feel of what uh, the colors and textures of the story are. Next. Then um, um, while all of that is going on, I'm I am writing. I am uh, starting to type, and um, and this is what this is what my writing actually looks like. Like in the like the second draft, it starts to look like this, um, and I add things in, take things out, and I write nah um, when I read something. Go Ugh, you know, um, and and I go through draft after draft after draft. Next. And then finally, I end it, and um, I even document the time that I finish. <laughs> Next. And then I finally, there is a, uh, there is a book, and I am so thrilled. Um, and the artwork uh, here is uh, from the brilliant Frank Morrison. Next. But there's nothing quite like knowing that your book is being recognized. So when I learned that um, that Clayton Bird was on the long list, I was ecstatic and a little shocked. Up uh, next, so imagine how I felt when I learned that it was a finalist, um, and that was really awesome. And so it's because of that. Um, that this book, um, I'm allowed to share this book to more than, you know, a few people, but it um, has that opportunity to actually be a national book and to be read 
um, throughout schools and libraries. So I'm very grateful uh, for this opportunity to speak to you all because a uh, um, good deal of you, you have read the book. So hooray, um, so hooray. This is something I look forward to. And I thank you and look forward to your questions and comments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for such a wonderful talk that took you th took us through inspirations for the book, uh, your writing process, your editing process, and finally the the recognition that the book received. Uh, I'm sure there's a a ton there that students are going to have questions about about all those different aspects of your writing life. And so, students, attendees, uh, if you want, if you have a question, just put it in the Q and A box, um, and we'll make sure to to ask that question. The, the first question that I wanted to ask is you talked a lot about the inspiration in, in music and in blues music and in hip hop. Uh, and for me, this felt like such a New York City book and there's so much yeah. of, of the parts of New York City that, that really uh, come alive. I know a lot of our students in the audience are students who are from New York City. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about uh, where, what's the place of New York City in, in this book. Okay, well, New York really grounds the story. Um, the, the thing that I love about being in New York, whether whatever borough it is, there is music. People play their music. And so, you know, each neighborhood, I think, has a personality because of the music and the food, you know. So um, I wanted to make sure that Clayton that Clayton Bird had its own specific kind of sound, that there is kind of like, um, there is kind of like that, um, that old school kind of blues um, in the background because it's kind of a somber story. You know, it's not a, hey, happy story. You know, it, it is kind of somber. So I wanted that kind of New York blues style, but also the hip hop, um, that kind of, um, that feeling of, um, things coming out from the street, you know, um, and that it comes from the people and not uh, from someplace else. But it's like the heartbeat of people. Um, there, there is actually an old school hip hop song, Heartbeat, um, that, um, that kind of um, inspires me as well. Um, a lot of the old school uh, hip hop songs. Yes. Thank you. We have a question from Casey. Uh, and Casey asks, what is the most rewarding part of being a writer? Wow. Okay. It's really hard to boil it down um, because I'm thinking about food. Um, but um, um, I, and, and the fact that if my book is successful, um, I can eat whatever I want. But I would say for me, the most rewarding part is seeing someone actually reading the book or, you know, some evidence that the book is out in the world. That is, that is so meaningful. Um, when you see someone um, kind of uh, squirreling themselves away, sitting down and reading your book and really into it, you don't want to disturb that with, hey, I'm the author. Okay, even though my 12-year-old self wants to do it, but, you know, at this stage of the game, I... It, that means so much to me that someone is taking my book into their into their minds, into their hearts, you know, um, and um, and having a relationship with it. So I, I just love the fact that people are reading the book. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. We have a lot of questions coming in now. So Yay! so I hope I hope you're ready for a lot of student questions. I'm ready. I'm here. <laughs> a, a question from. Uh, Lionel asks, how long did it take you to become a writer to, I guess, both to think of yourself as a writer and to find success as a writer? And a similar question from Elizabeth, how long did it take you to write this book, Clayton Bird Goes Underground? Okay, so um, you might have seen the, uh, in the uh, slide, it said, um, like, Nine, um, I think it was 2015 was the end date. I might have been like 11 something 2015. Yeah, 11 24 2015 at 9.03 a.m. Um, well, um, I never write the start date because when I start is never the 
real start of the book. That's the start of me thinking of the book and dreaming of it. Um, but when I end it, I know that, wow, this is the story. This is it. It might need a little revision because my editor will ask me for some. Um, but I know that this is the heart and soul of the book. It takes me, I am a slow writer. I am very slow. Uh, so it takes me a year and a half to, uh, to finish a novel like Clayton Bird Goes Underground. Most writers can write two books in a year. God bless them, I am not them. <laughs> it takes me a year and a half. <laughs> because I write, um, I, and, and then uh, there's so many drafts that I do. Um, and as for the a question about um, how long did it take me to be a writer? Well. I always thought I was one. Um, I, I used to, I, I just always wrote a lot as a kid. And uh, it was when I was like 12, 13, that I started going to the library and um, checking out books on um, how to, like, how to write a manuscript, where to send your manuscript, what happens when they reject them, what happens when they accept them. How much money can you make? Um, so I was, I was like, I was pumped from the time I was 13 and, and just writing my 500 words a day. You do not have to write 500 words a day. I think the most important thing for writing, uh, for writers is to be a reader and, um, and to read for your own enjoyment but also to like take something that you notice in the novel and, and say to yourself, hmm, how did they did that? How did they do that? Or I like the way they did that. Or hmm, I wouldn't have done it this way. I would have done it a different way. I would have started the story there. So um, becoming that, that um, becoming someone who really absorbs good writing and the, the flow of, um, of words on the page, um, I, I always read um, just so that I could have that sense of feeding my soul with, with, uh, with words that flow, because I always feel myself being very, um, I don't know, um, awkward. And so every, so it's like, um, uh, take, uh, take two Jackie Woodson's and go to bed and, and, and you'll wake up in the morning feeling better. Uh, <laughs> so I read a lot of other authors in order to grow my craft. But, um, you know, start writing. Every, t every time you write, you make yourself a little stronger. Just keep writing. We actually have a few questions about, uh, about your life as a reader. Um, and so we have a couple questions from Zoe, and and one of them is is a question about which writers do you look up to? Who are your who are your literary heroes that you oh. that you look up to? And a follow up question, if you if you want to name for the for the audience here, what is your favorite book? What's the what's your favorite book that you've read? Wow! Oh my goodness! Okay, so um, when I was um, uh, when I was in college. Um, I didn't have um, opportunity to read the books that I wanted to read. Um, I wanted to do an independent study on Black women writers. And so uh, when I went to the, uh, when I went to the chairperson about that, um, they said, well, I don't think there's enough writers for you to, um, for a basis for this study. Um, so as soon as I got out of school, I read every um, book by a black uh, female author that I could. So my um, my um, my literary mentors were um, Entezaki Shange, who wrote for colored girls who considered suicide when the rainbow was enough. Um, Toni Morrison, for sure, for the bluest eye. Um, okay, so a little side note. Um, my first novel, Blue Tights, I had to put the blue in there because of Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. Um, and also Sula and, um, and like um, um, Song of Solomon. Um, uh, Alice Walker, I read. Um, I read everything Alice Walker um, because I th thought she had a sensibility that I could relate to. She was Southern. And even though I um, wasn't born in the South, 
um, I'm of Southern parentage. And so I have those values, those roots in me. Um, and uh, Nikki Giovanni, there was just so many women. Um, but then as a child, um, I read, um, I read like, um, I read a books, a books to, that children would read. I read Beverly clearly, but I also read Eldridge Cleaver, like when I was in the, the, the sixth grade. Um, I read Island of the Blue Dolphin. Um, I loved that book. Um, and Harriet the Spy, because I was always um, writing. But the books that had impact on me was a, were books that my um, school librarian ordered specifically for me because she noticed that I was reading the same books over and over and over again. So she got me this book called 31 Brothers and Sisters. And it was about um, a girl, um, uh, the daughter of a Zulu chief who wanted to go on a hunt with her father and the men. Now that was un unheard of, unthinkable, but um, her father relented and she went on the hunt. And that meant so much to me because A, she was, um, uh, the way that they drew her, she was dark skin and she had um, short hair and she was um, by uh, definition back then, a tomboy. And those things, that all of that spoke to me. Um, I wanted to play football. I wanted to be a running back. My father said no. Um, I was training to box. He was like, I think it's now time for you to take some ballet lessons. <laughs> um, you know, and um, and I just wanted to do all kinds of things. So it was those kinds of female, those young female heroines that meant a lot to me as a young reader. Um, and I didn't read uh, YA uh, in my teen years. I read um, I read adult novels, but it was my post college reading, uh, re uh, finding my uh, my mother mentors, uh, my literary mentors that really helped to shape me and think about um, you know what did I want to say as a writer. Thank you. Do you, as a I'll ask a follow-up question. Do you, I know that you are a teacher now and that you share books with students often. Uh, what thought process goes into sharing books with students? Are you thinking about yourself as a young student or, or yeah, how do you think about those, those kinds of teaching lessons with books? Okay, so um, um, I am, um, I, I have, I have retired from my post at Vermont College of Fine Arts, but I am still connected uh, to, um, to the college. Um, when I work with um, with students, I think about their work, their voice, what it is they want to say, and um, what is the best way to get them there? Who is going to speak to them? Um, and uh, what kinds of issues do I want them to start thinking about um, to grow their crafts? And those are the kinds of books that I will start to recommend for my students. Um, and so um, um, maybe someone who, if, if I want you to think in terms of a girl's heart and soul, you know, I might, I might recommend um, Kevin Hankis's um, Olive's Ocean, or if I want you to think about um, uh, multiple, um, it, you know, it, it depends upon what it is that you want, that I think you need to pay attention uh, to, uh, things to focus on. Um, and writers have to think of so many different things. It's not just the story, the plot, the characters, but we have to really get down deep into what pushes the, what opens up the story and pushes it forward. And um, those things that are, are our own personal habits that can really hold back a story. So it's, so um, I was talking before about uh, becoming a, uh, um, a critical reader. Um, um, well, that is, that works for young people who are reading for school and for their own enjoyment, but also especially for uh, young writers who are really thinking seriously about um, telling stories and creating, um, you know, uh, creating whole people and lives and worlds, um, reading critically and being able to 
step back from their work and also come back to it and see something new. Um, That's what I think when you read other books, when you read from beyond yourself, it takes you out of yourself. So um, I would also suggest reading other genres. You know, um, if you read, um, if if you read realistic fiction, um, switch to switch to um, maybe something more speculative, um, just to kind of play with the sense of realism in your own work and to open it, explore possibilities. Um, but um, there is a whole, um, I, I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of books. There's so many of them. How do you choose? You know? We have uh, quite a few questions about your writing process that I'm going to get to, but I want to ask a question first from Elizabeth, uh, who asks, when you were younger, did you have any other careers in mind other than being a writer? And and what were those? Uh, uh, Okay, yes, yes. Um, Well, my mother wanted me to be a teacher. She would always say, you're going to teach at Columbia University uh, from the time I was five years old. So um, I, I knew that that's what I was supposed to do for my mother. Um, my father wanted me to be a lawyer. Um, and so, um, so that, um, I even went to college as a pre-law, um, uh, candidate. Um, but I, um, I, I always knew I was going to write. I, um, uh, the trick for me was that I thought I was a writer. <laughs> so I thought, okay, what else can I do? Um, I dance, dance was very big. It was very big. Somehow I went from boxing, um, and, and football to wanting to dance. And it was, um, uh, so I even, um, I even auditioned on Broadway, uh, which was, that was a fun experience. Okay. It's fun now that I look back at it, but I was really struggling it, um, to just get in, just to get into those auditions and, um, you know, just having, uh, making it from one, uh, one group, you, like you have to make, uh, this cut and then that cut. And then finally, like, um, you're, you're here and now you give them your song and you're going to sing and then you can sing and dance and you're going to be on Broadway. And I would give them my music and say, okay, T for two and sing as off key as my mother and I are known to sing. And so, um, needless to say, I, never got on Broadway, but um, I had dreams and, and I got pretty close a couple of times. Our Leith wants to know, uh, when you start a new novel, do you have a specific approach? Yeah, you know, I think um, every novel um, demands that I do something different. It depends upon what the novel is. Um, with uh, Clayton Burt, I really had to get into the music because I wanted to know what did the characters want and what they need. And that had to come out through music. So um, so I really immersed myself in music before I began to write. Um, um, and um, with uh, the book that I've just finished now, um, it, it is... Uh, um, it's an upper YA historical um, fiction. Um, I had to visit um, plantations um, in the South in order to really start. I didn't want to begin without stepping foot on the plantations that I would be writing about. Um, And I had to learn about um, what was it like to be a uh, plantation master and to worry about the soil and the cane crop and what have you. Um, and so each, each story asks me to do something different. Um, sometimes I have to do um, uh, timelines. In the case of historical fiction, I do a timeline because everything has to sync up and it has to be um, historically correct. And I have to know uh, what what else was going on, even though the the characters in the in the story 
are uh, concerned with domestic um, personal things, I have to know what's going on in the world around them um, just so that I can properly frame their lives. Um, but um, a, a story like Clayton Bird, um, yes, music was very, very important. Um, but I also had to, I also had to know, um, like, you know, I have to know a little bit about, um, just, um, like style, like, um, so I could, uh, picture the characters. I love picturing my characters, um, and, uh, maybe taking a person who's already out there in the world and kind of, um, letting them step in and be my character. Um, I, I don't do a lot of, um, I tell myself the story as opposed to outlining the story. I tell myself the story. I kind of wake up every morning and talk to myself and, and say, and say, you know, this is where the story begins and this is what happens next. And then this, and then this, and then this, and then that person comes in and then that, and this and that and the other, you know, um, and I usually hand write that. Um, and when I start to get stuck, that's when I know that either, the, you know, there's either a problem or I don't have enough information. And I, and that's the area where I have to go and do my research or dig down deep into the character, or I have to question, does my character belong there? Does this, is this story going in the right direction? Take this mess out, Rita, you know, um, before you know, before it sinks the story. Uh, sometimes, you know, I have to, you know, like, you, you have to make those decisions too. But telling myself this story really helps me to um, really know that I have proof of story and, and a direction. Uh, we actually have a few questions. You mentioned a project that you're working on now, and we have a few questions about uh, what are you, if you could share a little more about the writing project you're working on now, uh, if you can. Uh, um, sure, sure. Um, it, okay, so uh, this novel is called A Sitting in St. James. And um, it is, um, um, it, it came to me from a lot of different places, but the reason why I began to write it was that um, I had done a panel um, uh, for a screening of a film about the Black Panthers. And there was a young man, he had to be maybe 12 years old. And he, um, and he asked this question and he was in tears as he asked. He wanted to know why. Why do they hate us? You know, why do they, why do they try to kill us? And so I had to try to say um, um, as compassionately as I could um, that, um, that we come out of a history where people do not, um, uh, white people in particular, do not see black people as human beings. Um, and so I knew I wanted to come back to that. And it wasn't until I thought, hmm, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do it from the point of view of um, my ancestors, um, although um, my ancestral rep ancestral re uh, representation would be there. There would be Black people um, important to the story would be there, but the story would really follow um, the, the life of a, a slaveholding white family and um, and and so uh, so this is what this story is. It um, follows uh, the, um, the timeline of Madame Sylvie uh, de Marais Gilbert, and um, and she um, and and so we start from the French Revolution, then to the Haitian Revolution, and then the main uh, part of the story begins in um, current day. 19, 1860s, uh, actually 1860. And so uh, in that summer, um, I'm always writing in the summer. Um, uh, that is where the story uh, is. And you get to meet the people in the household that include this, um, the enslaved people as well as um, the slaveholding family. And, um, and then you get to know um, some of the people who are outside of the family as well. But um, 
it is my um, hope that uh, we can talk about um, um, ties that bound, bind us um, and what it means to break free of those uh, ties, to have the um, communication about, um, about entitlement um, and how we regard each other and its legacy, which is racism um, that we're still experiencing today. So um, it's, I, I think it's my most ambitious work. Um, it's about like 460 pages um, in five little books. Um, and um, I'm hoping to share that with you all in May. It's, I'm sure that our, our students listening will will definitely want to, to pick it up and read it. it, it uh, it's going back to a sort of long history of, of racism in the United States. Do you feel like this work is shaped at all about, you know, events in the past year, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, or events in the past few years? Do you feel like the recent history at all is shaping your perspectives? Oh, uh, without a doubt. Um, now, here's the wonderful thing about um, writing and being a writer. You are not writing for the times that you are living in now. You always have your eyes open. You're always seeing what is going on. You're always paying attention to attitudes that are beneath the surface and that are rising, you know. Um, and those things, I believe, help to um, shape what you're going to offer in terms of a, of, of a story. Um, I began this uh, writing in, well, I began putting it together in, um, in 2016. Um, uh, I don't write a, um, right away, especially if I don't know anything about um, being on a plantation and life in the 18, 1860s, I'm going to do research. I had to take um, the year to do the research because I was getting into, the story takes place in Louisiana in St. In St. James Parish. And so I had to dig deep into um, Creole culture. I had to know um, about um, uh, what does it take to um, to run a um, sugarcane um, plantation, um, and um, how is um, how is a plantation situated? All the little buildings and um, and how things worked. Um, so um, there there was an awful lot to to learn um, before I could really um, start to tell the story. Then when I had enough. Then I started to shape the story. And it was really as I was doing the research that I said, okay, yes, um, this is going to be a paramount part of the storytelling. Um, and that helped me to shape Lucienne, who is the master, um, and, um, and Madame Silve, who is really, you know, she holds all the power in the family. Um, and then as life is happening around, um, around, out in the world, um, current day, it gives me strength to tell the story as I'm telling it. It tells me, yes, yes, the ancestors are speaking to you. Yes, yes, they are watching. Yes, this is what is happening. This is what has been happening. Yes, keep writing. Yes. So, um, so as much as what is going on, like, you know, the, um, it's in me because I've been seeing it. I've been seeing it for so long. Um, it's really, it's also the past. It's also the past that I feel like, let me be as true to that as I can be, because I think that has, um, that will help to have more of a conversation about why, as the boy stood before me in tears, why? Um, and so, you know, um, I think this current time, people are writing about this current time, but it's really going to be you young people today who will look back on it and, and write 
that will have the, um, the perspective, the perspective that we need to really understand and to know and to document, you know, what has been going on, what has historically been going on with our people. So. As you talk about the, the present day, we have a, a question from Edgar um, about whether the pandemic slowed down your writing process at all. Ah, so um, yes, it has. It has. Because a good deal of writing for me is freedom. And freedom means um, not being aware of um, everything. Not being aware of a person coming toward me breathing <laughs> without a mask, <laughs> uh, laughing without a mask, you know, those kinds of things. Um, not being able to just get on the train and zone out. Um, not being able to um, go to the library and pick out, um, pick out the uh, books that I need. Um, so in that way, it has hindered me. Um, but, um, it also, you know, I'm a solitary person. I'm used to, I, I like being by myself. I like the quiet. Um, I like, um, I, I just really like being locked in my own little world, dreaming. So in that way, this time has been good to me, has been, um, has been really uh, helpful. Um, but there's something about freedom that change, that changes the stance from where I write. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think that that, that makes sense and answers uh, Edgar's question. I think there's a sort of similar question here, a couple questions that in which students are really curious, almost in a sort of how the sausage gets made sense of, yeah. of how, how does an author get paid? How does an author make an income off of their writing? What's the process by which someone, you know, turns turns their writing, turns the things that they feel really passionate about into a career that can, that can sustain them and that they can make a living on. Okay. So I am the worst person to ask that question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Um, I, I say I'm the worst person because, um, I, uh, first, my first uh, novel was published in 1987. And um, it was a novel that I wrote in college. So it took like seven, eight years for that novel to be published. And way back then, um, uh, that first book, um, the advance was so low, I could not quit my job. But it's different now. It is a lot different. You, I believe you have a lot more opportunity to make money and you won't do the silly things that I did. Um, I would not get an agent. Um, I still don't have one for my novels. Um, you will get an agent. You will, you will write so well that an agent will read your work and say, yes, I can, um, I can help this person, uh, get paid. Th that's important. If you're writing a book that you um, that uh, that you expect to have published by the major publishers, please get an agent. Please, please get an agent. Do the best you can to get an agent, and then they and as they read their work, your work, they will advise you. They will ask you for revision. You must be ready to revise. Yes, because if you can't revise for your agent, how will you revise? For an editor, because that is the main thing that a writer must do. They must be the creative, um, the creative engine of the work. Um, they must be, you know, um, you you are the creator of the work, but you also have to um, be able to revise your work. You can talk about things with your with your editor, but revision, I, I can't say it enough, is so important. Um, today. Today, I believe um, because of social media, you have different 
you have different platforms that you can sell your work, that you can become known. And all of those things are helpful. Um, my hat is off to every author who is Instagramming, TikToking, twit- tweeting, podcasting, doing all of those things. If you can create a a marketing engine for yourself in that way, that's a good way to get notice from a publisher. If you come to them with so many thousands, if not a million um, uh, followers or so, um, then your chances of publication hmm, sounds pretty good. But I, I say um, um, honor the craft itself, write as well as you can, and then always seek to write better. Um, always look into how can you write better? How can you tell the story better? Um, uh, all of those things. Um, I want to write YA, uh, please be reading YA, you know, um, I want to write picture books. You must read picture books, make sure that you are on top of your game in that way. Um, but yes, you can make a living writing. Um, um, a lot of writers write and teach, okay? Um, so that would mean that you would have to have an MA or an MFA. Um, a lot of writers uh, write and do something else. In a way, that can be a very good thing because you do need to get your mind off of the writing. And you also have to have that feeling of, oh my goodness, I can't wait to get back to my writing. And that helps a lot when you're not in front of it a lot. Um, you can make any, um, a debut novelist can make um, in the six figures based on no sales, just based on the promise of a book. That can, that can very well happen. Um, but again, um, write as well as you can and have something to say, not just the one book, not just the one book. Um, know uh, your agent and your editor, your publisher needs to know that you have more stories to tell. So, um, you know, always be thinking about your next story. Um, uh, th- there are just so many different, and I, I keep saying book, 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 but Know that um, this applies, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of um, graphic artists, um, illustrators as well. Um, if you are uh, uh, seeking to publish something, um, you know, you, you have to also make sure that you pretty much have your own kind of marketing machine. I know back in, uh, back in my day, um, you had to have the website, um, but you, but you really do have to have a lot more of that going on for you. Um, and, um, um, you know, you, you just keep at it. It's, it's so easy to not write. It's so easy to, um, it's so easy to uh, to push it aside or to say, oh, you know, when I get uh, more time, I will this. When I, um, what whatever the 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 push off thing is, that's when I'll write. No, 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 no. Um, write a little bit every day. Believe in this story that you're envisioning and write a little bit every day. Every day, give yourself a day off. Um, but write every day. It does not have to be 20 pages. Um, most writers write about like, like four and five pages every day, you know, um, and then move on. Um, um, but do that, make that commitment. My good friend, the late Walter Dean Myers used to wake up at like four o'clock in the morning um, uh, faithfully and write four to eight pages every day. And he published like four books a year. Um, okay. So I don't do that, but, um, <laughs> but do write every day, you know, however, however much you write a writer is someone who writes, right. Thank you. That's wonderful advice. I should have mentioned that that question uh, came from LaShonda, who I think is probably thinking about a, a career as a writer. And I, that's really great advice for for all of our students listening on on the writing process and uh, and how to be a writer. The last question that I want to ask is your advice on reading. Um, you've talked a lot about 
uh, a number of influences and a number of books that you find really inspiring. Uh, but I'd love for you to, to close out for us with just three book oh recommendations for, for students. Wow. I think that was my hardest, that was my hardest, um, uh, my hardest question uh, because like, uh, um, mm, okay. So, um, no, um, oh gee. Okay. So can I just say anything by case in, uh, by case in calendar, just anything k-a-c-e-n-c-a-l-l-e-n-d-e-r i can't pick a one of his books i would say anything by um by Kaysen. um um i think also um okay so i happen to like we dream of space by um 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 aaron entrada kelly um i'm like um it starts off with a uh, pinball with a pinball game. So um, already I'm hooked. Um, <laughs> and um, anything by E.B. Zaboy. Um, okay, so I am a huge Trekkie. So my life as an ice cream sandwich is like, like, um, you know, it's it's my it's my pleasure to read that because it also bends um um like it, it combines genres you've got a little um graphic novel going on little comics going on in there and and it's got the hip hop in it the early old school hip hop and of course it's got like the star track um themes going on in there um uh so i do like that but um but i'm um, I just started her punching the air, which she uh, which she co-wrote, um, and um, so oh, okay. So anything by uh, by E.B. Zaboy. Um, oh, there's too much. There's too much. <laughs> oh, you've you've perfectly set me up for for my closing remarks here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for answering all of our questions. And thank you, lastly, for making the perfect segue to to my closing remarks. Because first, I'll mention that uh, Case and Calendar is one of our National Book Award finalists for Young People's Lit Literature this year. Um, and so Case will be at the ceremony next Wednesday evening uh, to see if they win the National Book Award for Young People's Literature for the novel um, King and the Dragonflies. And second yes. setup that you that you perfectly did for me is that our next Book Up at Home event is going to be on December 9th uh, at 4 p.m. Same login link uh, that you used today, and that will be with E.B. Zaboy. Uh, and next month, our featured book will be My Life as an Ice Cream Sandwich. Um, so thank you for the, the perfect book recommendation uh, that, that set us up perfectly for, for next month. Thank you again for being here with us. And thank you to everybody who's watching this at home. Uh, thank you so much for being here and have a nice night. Bye, everyone. <laughs>